Kei akuranga tira tēnā koutou katoa, nau mai hoki mai anō ki a marae o tira ki tā tātou hōtaka tuatahi. Mō tēnei tau, rua mano, rua te kau māwha. Kāti, anti-Māori, unfair, oppressive. That's the coalition government as described by claimants trying to save the Māori Health Authority. Te Akafaiora was launched by the Labour-led government less than a year ago to address Māori health inequities. This week, it was gone. Jody Ihaka reports. Marae has been invited into the engine room of the legal challenge for the Waitangi Tribunal claim Y3307 on Auckland's North Shore, Treaty of Waitangi specialist lawyer Roy Mata Smale prepares to update the team. We have the Crown evidence which was filed. You've seen that I've had a go at writing some cross-examination. I've circulated that to all the claimant and interested party lawyers. The lead claim team is made up of two lawyers representing four claimants and 28 other sets of interested parties. The Crown has been very transparent in, in saying that this was a political decision. And so we knew we had to get a claim in right away. We had to explain to the tribunal that this is urgent and it needs to be heard. So we put the claim together in a couple of weeks, put the evidence together, um, made all the arguments about why this is urgent. The lead claimants are Janice Cooker, zooming in from Tauranga, and Lady Tūreiti Moxon in Kirikiriroa. How do you see this claim and the way the government has handled it so far? Well, it's purely racism. And it's everything that they have done, every decision that they have made in relation to the 100-day plan has been anti-Māori sentiment. And the worst of it is the government have blatantly been saying so. The, uh, and, and talking as if um, being anti-Māori is OK. Working round the clock, they are relying on experience and history to keep the legal fight alive. This is not the first time we've been here, because every time there's an election, out comes the race card and they start, start using us as a political football to win votes. The Crown has conceded the decision to scrap Te Aka Whaiora was purely political. How do you describe your approach to this claim? We had to work fast. What's really great with working with um, Janice and Tureiti is they're just so quick in pointing me in the right direction of what I need to be um, responding on, what I need to be reminding the tribunal about. The claim fighting the disestablishment of Te Aka Whaiora was filed with the Waitangi Tribunal in late December last year. The tribunal isn't, isn't wanting to question any of the claimants or interested parties. The government's fast-track approach is considered an unfair power play designed to shut down Māori. The government have put forward a whole lot of policies that actually do resonate with some people in our country. But for the majority of, of this country, I don't think they think like that. I don't think they feel like that. And I certainly don't think that what the government is doing is what's best for Aotearoa New Zealand and particularly for race relations in our country. It's extremely racist and anti-Māori. Lady Tūreiti, who these days runs Te Kōhau Health in Kirikiriroa, has been fighting to improve Māori health for decades, using both her legal skills and extensive tribal mātauranga. She cites a 2019 report from the tribunal that ruled Māori are guaranteed tinoranga tiratanga over hauora Māori. They have absolutely disregarded Te Tiriti or Waitangi. They've absolutely disregarded the partnership that the treaty stands for and should be upheld. They have certainly done everything that you could possibly think of to undermine the process of Māori Tinoranga Tiritanga, of Māori, mana, Māori mana Motuhake, totally right the way through it, in the name of popularism. She references the Hauora Report. That 2019 tribunal report outlines the scale of inequity. Māori men live eight fewer years than non-Māori. Māori women live nine fewer years. Māori die from cancer more than twice the rate of non-Māori. 
Māori with heart disease are nearly nine times more likely to die than non-Māori. This government and successive governments, the previous governments, have always said they know what's better for Māori. They know what, what, what Māori need. They know what iwi need. But in actual fact, what we're saying to them is we know what we need. We want to take care of our own house. We want to have our own rangatiritanga over the decisions that are made about us. And that's really the crux of it. While Marae was with Lady Tūraiti, she learned the Crown had tabled the bill to end the Māori Health Authority. Lady Tūraiti, what's happening here? Well, they're going to pass the bill under urgency today. And how did you find this out? I just got news from our lawyer. Mr Speaker, I move that the Paiora Disestablishment of Māori Health Authority Amendment Bill be now read a first time. Disestablishment was agreed to by all three governing parties in their coalition agreements and mandated by the results of the 2023 general election, where it was canvassed at length on the campaign trail. While the particular version of the dream that the Māori Health Authority laid out is coming to an end today, I want to paint a different dream, one that will be outcomes-driven, providing greater devolved decision-making that will deliver care as close to the home and the hapu as possible. There is organisational expertise in the Māori Health Authority, and I want to retain that. I say to Māori Health Authority staff to please join me, guide me and help us together to row a different waka towards better health outcomes. First of all, I think it's really important to put context to the rest of Aotearoa, because that's who we're speaking to today, because uh, Taringa Maro over to my left, they're not listening, they won't listen, and can, why would they listen when 83% of Māori did not support this government? He waiata tangi ki oku whanaunga e te maangai o te whare. Nā te mea ko rātou e arahi ana e tēnei kaupapa, hei takahi, takahi, i te tiriti o waitangi, takahi, takahi i te iwi Māori, takahi i ngā moi moia, ngā wawata, o wā tātou tūpuna, o te anaia nei, o te apōpō hoki. Koira tō, ma, tō rātou mahi i roto i tēnei pare pare mata. You know, you can have all the strategies in the world, eh? You know, looking... And um, every successive government's got a brand new idea, new way of doing things, and you're, so you're just jumping from one thing to another thing to another thing. The claim team predicted and was prepared for this political move. For years and years and years, they have legislated us out of our land, they have legislated us out of our language, they have legislated out, us out of our, our rongoa, our knowledge and our mātauranga, and yet here we are again. By tabling the bill, the coalition government circumvented the Waitangi Tribunal's jurisdiction. The case and the urgent hearing cannot proceed now. They keep breaching and they keep doing things that are, tr are, are basically akin to assimilation. They keep, keep making us second-class citizens in our, own, in our own country. They keep basically disrespecting who we are, what we stand for, our culture, and only trot us out when they've got dignitaries coming, who come to the country. During the election campaign, the government used the slogan, let's take our country back. What does that even mean? Exactly. Basically, they're putting us back into a, a situation where they can control us, where we can be assimilated, where we can be put down in our place and made to, to do as they believe is right, right for this country. But actually, I don't think they've really thought this through enough. They've not thought how far New Zealand and New Zealanders have moved away from that kind of monocultural thinking and doing. In 1907, the government introduced the Tohunga Suppression Act. How do you see that and how does it compare to what's happening today? Well, again, the Tohunga was the, the person in amongst our communities who had the knowledge, the knowledge of, of of healing, the knowledge of our rungwa, and that wisdom and that knowledge was lost when they legislated us out of it. This is a fight that you've fought for decades. Why do you keep on doing it? Because 
I believe in our future generations. If this government continues on the trajectory that it, it, it says it will, I think that Māori will stand up, iwi will stand up, everyone will stand up and say, no, enough. What is your next legal move? Once the legislation is passed, um, we will have two pathways. One will be to go back to the Waitangi Tribunal. The other one is High Court action. Ko roia e a te teana, a kua whai whakaitanga a Mike Smith i te ture. Kia whawha ia kia ora ai te ao, ti matamai ana ki ao te aroa nei. I whakai te katoa o te koti matua ki aia, a nā tērā ka wātea te ara kia Smith, ki te tōake i te whitu u manganui o ao te aroa ki te koti, kia patua pea o rātou pūkoro mō te whai wahi nui ki te mahana haeretanga o te āhuarangi o tira o te ao. Ko ngā umanga e whitu nei, ko Fonterra, Genesis Energy, Dairy Holdings, New Zealand Steel, Z Energy, Channel Infrastructure NZ and BT Mining. Hei tā, Mike Smith, e tai kākā ana ia mō te mahi uuua kei mua i āia ki roto i te koti. Nō ngā puhi me ngā ti kahu āia, a kua roa ia e whaka ore ore ana i te marea ki ngā take mana whenua Māori, Mana reo Māori hoki. Good evening. An attempt to chop down a national landmark in Auckland at first appeared to be a simple case of vandalism, but it quickly developed into a political protest. The man accused of attacking the lone pine on One Tree Hill with a chainsaw says he was drawing attention to Māori grievances. Those New Zealanders that feel outraged, perhaps they can start to understand the sense of outrage that, that we're currently feeling. Puta noa i te ao, kei te wahi kotahi ngā whakaaro o ngā kaipū taiao, ko te tino pūtake, o te kahaake o te rongo haere me te kino haere o ngā whiunga huarere ki ao te aroa nei, ko te mahana haere tanga o te ao. I tēnei wā hoki i te rātau, i te whakapāho atu a marae i ngā kōrero mō te parekura i mahue iho i a huripari Gabriel. I tēnei wā tonu nei, i tēnei tau nei, kei te whakatefatefa tonu a o tautahi i te ahi kino tuarua i ngā tau e whitu ki ngā kohatu whakarakaraka o tamatea pō kai whenua. He ahi i kai anora i te hia rau heketea ngahere whenua pātiti anō hoki. Kā ti i āta noho e Lee Marama McLaughlin ki te ui ui i te māngai a huarangi mo te kāhui rangatira a iwi i a Mike Smith and began by asking how is his whenua affected by climate change. I live on the east coast of, of Taitokoro, but all the way down the east coast, you know, down the Bay of Plenty, down in Tairapati, down in Ngāti Kaurinanu area, Ikaroa, uh, we've seen just the, um, you know, we can see and measure the impacts of climate change already rolling out. It's not some abstract that's off in the future and some time to come. It's happening now and, um, and we can observe it. You know, we can walk around and show where the sea level has risen, you know, we can show the erosion in the land. Um, you know, we can demonstrate where there used to be houses that have been washed away in floods and, 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 and families dispossessed by those um, flood events. The meteorologists um, tell us they've got classifications for these events and they say, oh, that's a once in a hundred year flood. And then less than a hundred days later, another flood of that same magnitude comes through. So what we can clearly see is that the, um, the magnitude and the time scale of these things is rapidly shortening, and we're seeing more and more of these events, events and it's uh, it's not part of the natural rhythms of the of the weather. How are you linking that to Fonterra and say not the Taylor Swift global tour and all of the things that go on as part of that? We can be really surgically uh, precise about where uh, which areas are producing the carbon and what are the industries in those areas that are that are doing it. When you think back, thermometers were only invented just over 100 years ago. And now we've got satellites flying over the Earth that can measure uh, within a, you know, a millimetre of how thick the ice is, uh, for example. So we've got these really sophisticated uh, tools now that are able to tell us precisely and give us confidence in uh, what we're seeing, the changes that we're seeing in the environment. What I mean, some of the defendants are saying is that they are meeting all of the obligations to the New Zealand um, government as it stands and that uh, going ahead with this case um, could in turn chew up the time that they would be spending um, reducing their emissions. No, I don't buy that because, you know, the, uh, for example, the agricultural industry has been uh, kicking the can down the road in terms of their com compliance. Um, they're not even in the ETS. 
The emissions trading scheme is the mechanism that the government developed in order to incentivise companies to pull down their emissions, set some targets, they agree to them. But the dairy industry, Ontario and the New Zealand Dairy Board, have said, oh, we don't want to be part of that. We know that these, um, that these uh, polluting industries are causing harm to, to people, uh, to the environment, and really are making the world a far more difficult place uh, for the unborn generations yet to come, you know, for them to live in. We, and they know it. Companies will make the argument that um, should this case get across the line, prices will go up consumers will look to buy their dairy products overseas, perhaps somewhere um, where they have fewer environmental protections in place. So potentially, you're not solving a problem here, you're just moving it somewhere else, but Aotearoa will be the one who misses out economically. Well, that's just fear-mongering, you know, they're wanting to panic um, consumers into thinking that, uh, you know, they won't be able to get the products uh, that they're used to getting. You know, um, People will always be able to get milk. If you want to be in the milk business, you don't have to be in the cow business. It's the cows that are causing the problems. We could, we could remove every single cow from Aotearoa and still have a burgeoning milk industry because these days they're making coconut milk, soy milk, uh, oats milk, and that's what a lot of people are going for these days because of the climate footprint of the dairy industry. What are we going to do about transport? Transport is the second largest uh, emission sector. If you look at the pie graph, the half of it is uh, agriculture, and then the next biggest slice of the pie is transport. And so what we've got to do is to start transitioning away from the types of uh, transport that we've been used to in the last 100 years, and which is cars, you know, essentially. And so we've got a car culture, we're addicted to fossil fuels, and we've got to figure out a way around that. We need a better public transport system. And it's uh, really disturbing to see the current government rolling back the type of uh, policies uh, that previously supported and increased public uh, transport. What ticking are you, are you wanting applied here? Well, where I'm from, if somebody comes into Aorohe, this is in the traditional times, uh, came into Aorohe threatening the, uh, the lives of uh, our families and our children, uh, we'd just kill them. That's the tikang where I come from. We don't do that anymore, of course. Instead of killing them, what we do now is to banish them and just go, look, you know, sorry, yeah, that's you can't be doing that here. You can't be threatening our lives. So on your bike, off you go. Um, change your behaviour and perhaps you can come back. And so that's one of the tikang that we've already applied. So we applied that when it came to deep sea oil drilling. And so there were rigs being set over here. Well, we organised around the motu with various iwi groups and one by one, we uh, expelled uh, a dozen uh, major oil companies from our territorial waters. We banished them. We didn't attack them, we didn't blow up their rigs, we didn't hurt anybody, but we just put enough pressure on them to say, you're not welcome here, uh, you've got to go. When you look at global emissions, um, you know, New Zealand's just a blip on the radar. So is this going to cause really any effect? 30% of the global emissions are made up of little countries like ours, all joined up together. And so if we all do our bit, that adds up to one whole third of the globe's emissions. So it is important what we do, number one, just from the numbers. Also, as, uh, as influencers and innovators, Aotearoa has got a really good reputation around the world as being the little country who does good. After all this effort that you've put in so far, what's going to happen if you go through, have your day in court, you win your argument, you get to the point where you're ready for action to happen and say the government just comes in and legislates it all away? That's a possibility. I'd say that would be extremely high risk politically for any government to do that because, as I say, increasingly it's becoming evident to the public that these are real and present threats. Uh, but if the government comes in and, and they've done this before, right? Like, we've seen a change of government that's just come in and just thrown all these policies out. They're writing new laws under urgency. They're bypassing the normal democratic processes where they open these new reforms up for public scrutiny and get people to come in and they test it to make sure that they've got the law right. That's gone out the window in this current government. It raises the question of whether or not we need to take Climate issues, we need to depoliticise them, get them out of the hands of government. They can't be trusted in the hands of government. 
uh, and, and put them above uh, law reform, and that would be um, by enshrining them constitutionally to put them out of the reach of, um, of being mucked around with, I guess. Well, I reckon everybody's got a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, the marama, you know, and um, I'm sort of trying to do my bit, but there's lots of us out there, really smart um, people, uh, who have got a piece of that jigsaw puzzle, and, and that if we're all applying our thinking towards that problem, if we can agree that this is the problem, and therefore this is the solution, and then we just apply all our energy and our thinking to solving that problem, I think we'll, I think we'll get there for our, for our children. If we don't, I'm really worried that it's game over, you know, to be true, honest. Lee Marama McLaughlin Tera e Kororoana kia Mike Smith. Now, Marai spoke to a number of companies which will be fighting their corner when the case arrives in court. Z Energy said in a statement it believes it's the role of the government, not the courts, to develop policy and legislation needed to transition Aotearoa to a low carbon economy. Genesis, Genesis Energy agreed and went on to outline the work they're already doing. Genesis has undertaken for its generation fleet to be 95% renewable by 2035 and for its business to be net zero by 2040. Investing $1.1 billion in new renewable generation and batteries by 2030. Progress is also being made toward replacing coal at Huntley Power Station with biomass, which, sustainably procured, would have almost zero carbon emissions. Helping our customers switch from fossil fuels to electricity through EV plans and, in future, support to change their energy source for cooking and heating. And on to Fonterra. So Fonterra said it was disappointed in the Supreme Court's ruling, but that they are committed to ensuring the New Zealand dairy industry remains at the forefront of low emissions food production. We recently set a target to reduce on-farm emissions intensity by 30% by 2030 from a 2018 baseline. We also have targets to reduce our scope 1 and 2 operational emissions by 50% by 2030 from a 2018 baseline. We're investing in innovation and infrastructure to remove greenhouse gas emissions from our manufacturing sites and have committed to stop using coal by 2037 on our way to being net zero by 2050. These targets are aligned with international standards which seek to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And of course, Ehoama Marae will be following the case with interest. A legal expert, Dr. Carwin Jones, talks with Lee Marama McLaughlin. We haven't really seen the issues of climate change or greenhouse gas emit emitters um, be brought through the courts in litigation like this. And it's partly because it, it is a complicated thing to try and work out what their contributions are. There's no dispute that the emission of greenhouse gases contributes to climate change, causes harm. But the questions will be around what's the contribution of these particular companies to that harm, and is it such that they should bear a particular burden? In some ways, you look at those companies that are involved and you think, well, they're contributing a very small amount to global greenhouse gas emissions, so why should they be held any more liable than any of the rest of us? On the other hand, you look at their contribution to greenhouse gas emissions in, in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, um, and they are responsible for a significant amount of those greenhouse gas emissions, and so you might think, well, actually, we can say, here's a group that ought to be bearing some liability for that. So I think there are some real challenges of an evidence of, of what he will need to demonstrate and it will be around thinking about the connection between the uh, emission of greenhouse gases by these particular companies uh, to the harm caused to his land. Why do you think these companies might be worried? Their argument, I think, is, is, has been around thinking, well, actually, we're not the only ones who are contributing to this, um, and we can't be held responsible for all the harm of climate change for every 
person who owns land, because it does then create the possibility of thinking about, well, you know, Mike Smith isn't going to be the only person who's affected, uh, and so it potentially raises uh, liability and other kinds of cases for them. Often in tort law, the, the kind of usual remedy or response is, is uh, damages. It's a kind of payment uh, to, to address the harm that's taken place. Now, actually, that's not what, what's being asked for in this case. He's asking for a declaration that these companies are causing harm in this way to him, um, and he wants them to stop doing it is essentially the key point. How will tikanga be applied in this case, do you think? So the idea of referring to tikanga in the development of New Zealand common law through the courts in this kind of way isn't a new idea. Um, it is something which has developed a lot in recent years. I think it is significant in terms of the way in which tikanga here has been used to strengthen the argument for recognising harm uh, that's been caused. And so that may well be something which can be um, taken on by Indigenous people in other jurisdictions as well. The argument here is not that there are obligations under tikanga that these companies owe to Mike Smith. Uh, they're, they're not seeking to apply tikanga as law in that way. But what they are saying is that when you're making an assessment about the nature of the harm that's caused, about the relationship both between Mike Smith and his whenua, but also the relationship that exists between those companies and Mike and the whenua, um, that those things ought to take into account tikanga and, and how those relationships look, how those obligations look from a tikanga perspective. If you were a betting man, Carwin, <laughs> What do you think his chances are? So I, I think it's it's so difficult to, to assess what's going to happen. Uh, I, I, I do think there are still lots of challenges in terms of the evidence that's going to need to be brought to support uh, his argument and, and steps that he'll need to go through uh, to, to demonstrate this harm and the contribution of these companies. You know, just because we haven't seen litigation like this in other countries and we saw that the, initially the High Court and Court of Appeal didn't think this was a viable argument, it's going to be a new, or open up a new area of, of law or liability, then I think that mitigates against Mike. On the other hand, the fact that this is the kind of biggest challenge of our time, climate change, and that the courts and the common law is designed to be able to respond to the challenges that we face as society. You would like to think, and I hope that the courts, the judges would also like to think that they have a role here, that, that actually they can respond and provide some response to this. E mihi ana kia koe kawen i o mohi o tanga. For more marae, check us out online. Hei te rawiki. Ko te reo, te take.